Well, this morning, I invite you to open a Bible to Isaiah chapter 6. We begin a new sermon series called Headspace. And the idea is to help us focus our thoughts and our minds on the words of Jesus, and on the voice of Jesus, rather than the lies that we either tell ourselves or that the world tells us or that Satan himself tells us. In John chapter 10, as Jesus is declaring himself to be the good shepherd who loves his sheep, he says this, he says, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and no one will snatch them out of my hand. And so the voice of Jesus is declaring to you and to me, no matter what our situations, our circumstances are, that we are his, that you and I belong to him and that you and I have given the gift of eternal life because of who Jesus is and what he has done. Now, if you're a Christian, what I just said probably did not surprise you, right? Like how many of you, if you believe in Jesus, already knew I belong to him, right? Now, here's the deal. That's a wonderful truth, but we often forget it. All right. Luther often said that we, we need to be reminded of the gospel every single day because we forget it every single day. Now, what Luther meant by that was not that you and I suddenly get amnesia and forget what the gospel is or who Jesus is when we wake up tomorrow. The point that he was making is that we forget to live in the truth of the gospel, the truth that Jesus loves you, that he has forgiven you, and the truth that Jesus just declared in John 10, that you belong to him, and that, that nothing and no one can snatch you out of his hand. But the issue is that because we're sinful ourselves, because the world is filled with sin and brokenness, we forget what Jesus has said, right? Any of you ever struggled with guilt? feeling a little bad, anybody struggle with shame, right? What we're doing in those moments is we're forgetting the voice of Jesus that tells us you are loved, you're forgiven, you have eternal life. We're forgetting the voice of Jesus that says you belong to him, right? And that promise that he says, no one can snatch you out of his hands. Now, here's the really good news. That means Satan can't snatch you out of his hands. It means the world can't snatch you out of his hands. And it means you can't do it either, no matter how hard you might try with your own sin, your own stubbornness, or maybe only just believing all of the lies, right? There are a lot of times in our lives where we end up believing the lies of Satan and the world more than we believe the voice of Jesus. We think to ourselves, well, I'm not enough. I'm not good enough. I'm not living well enough. I'm not doing the right things. And if you're going down that path far enough, guess what begins to happen? You think, I think Jesus dropped me. I think he let go of me. Like, I don't, I'm not sure if he still cares for me. I'm not sure if he still loves me, right? And this is why it's so important for you and I as followers of Jesus, even if you've been believing your whole life, to be reminded of the voice of Jesus and what he says. Right? So anybody ever get a song stuck in your head? Anybody ever done that? Was it a good song <laughs> or was it not a great song, right? Usually that's how it works for me is there's a song or a melody I'll start singing in my head or get stuck in my head and it's not one of my favorites, right? And it just drives you insane and it just goes on and on and on. Anybody ever had that experience where you just get like that earworm and it's just a thought or it's just a song or a melody, it's, just, it's, just, it's there and it's driving you insane, Anybody ever do the trick where you try to listen to your whole playlist to try to get rid of it? And like while you're in the middle of a new song, the other one breaks in and you're like, nope, never mind. We're, we're still here, right? Am I the only one that's ever been through this torture? All right? Or are you just like, well, let's watch a movie. You start calling all your friends. And you're like, what do you want to talk about? Like, anything. Just put a new thought into my brain, right? And it, it, it just gets stuck there. And it can get really, really hard to get rid of. And here's the thing, that's the same way that the lies that, that Satan wants us to believe work. 
All of a sudden, they get there. We can acknowledge, we can say, oh, they're not good or they're, they're not helpful thoughts for us, right? Sometimes we get thoughts that we tell ourselves over and over and over again that are really good, like, you could do it. Like, you just keep trying harder, right? Your parents tell your kids you could do anything you put your mind to, right? And it's, that's a lie, but it's a, it's a nice one, all right? Like, because I'm not in the NBA, so I, I did, that didn't come true for me, all right? But then there's other times where, like a song getting stuck in our head, lies or negative self-talk or thoughts get stuck in our heads, right? And we, that's all we can hear. It sounds like it's the only voice we can hear, that we're not good enough, that we don't measure up. Satan wants us to believe that, oh, God doesn't love you, or, or Jesus says, he's dropped you, he's not holding on to you anymore. And all of a sudden, before we know it, all of these negative thoughts, all these lies get stuck in our head, and it's really hard to drown them out sometimes, right? It's really hard to let them go. Right? Here's an example of this as a pastor. People come to me, and they have guilt or they have a sin that they want to confess. And I will, because I've made an oath and because I believe in Jesus, always tell you, you are forgiven in Jesus. That Jesus loves you and he forgives you. And a lot of times that works. People go, thank you, pastor. And they walk away feeling renewed and refreshed and going, okay, I have the truth of the word of Jesus. Jesus loves you and he forgives me. But then sometimes, instead of believing the voice of Jesus that you are forgiven and loved, the voice of Satan, this lie comes in and people will tell me, oh, you know, pastor, I know, I know Jesus loves me. I know Jesus forgives me. And I always know when you're not believing it, by the way, <laughs> because you do the dismissive like, yeah, I already know that, right? Anybody ever done this? You're like, yeah, I already know that. And then here's the follow-up almost every single time but I just can't forgive myself, right? Anybody ever thought that or said that? Maybe you've had a friend, right? Oh yeah, oh yeah, Jesus forgives me. That he, like, but I can't forgive myself. And what we are doing in that moment is instead of listening to the voice of Jesus that declares you are loved and you are forgiven, we're listening to the voice that say, we're listening to a lie that says you are not enough. You are not enough to be forgiven. You are not enough to be loved by Jesus right now. You need to do more and be better. And here's the problem with that, is that when we reject the voice of Jesus, we listen to our own lies that we tell ourselves, we listen to the lies of Satan, is it leads to all kinds of sorrow and grief and destruction. In fact, in John chapter 8, verse 44, it says Jesus is speaking about Satan, and he says this, there is no truth in the devil. When he tells a lie, he speaks his native tongue because he is a liar and a father of lies. And then later on in John chapter 10, Jesus speaking about Satan says he comes only to kill and destroy. So the voice of Jesus says that you are his sheep that you belong to him, that he has forgiven you, that he redeems you of all of your sins. And in John 10, he makes a promise that says, no one can snatch you out of my hand. He has given you eternal life and he is holding on to you forever. That's a wonderful promise. Which means even when you get lost like sheep do, even when you and I wander away and don't live the way we we're supposed to live, how many of you are willing to admit you didn't live the way you're supposed to live this past week? Right? Guess what Jesus says about you? You're his sheep, and no one can snatch you out of his hand. So the good news of the gospel, the voice of Jesus, the truth of Jesus is that, that he's holding on to you. And even when you feel like you're not enough or that you don't measure up or that you're not good enough or you, you've gotten too lost, you've wandered too far away, he's saying, no, you're still my sheep. And I'm still holding on to you. And this is what life looks like this side of heaven. Right? The, of all of our sin and the sin of the world and all of the brokenness is that we have the voice of Jesus calling out to us, declaring to us that we are loved and forgiven, that we belong to him. And yet, Satan is at work trying to deceive you and me, trying to get you and I to believe 
lies like we're not enough, that we're not worthy of God's love, that, that Jesus isn't holding on to us anymore because we've done too many wrong things. We, we've lived too imperfectly. Or maybe if you've been a Christian all your life, you think, I'm just too big of a hypocrite to still be loved by Jesus. And in Isaiah chapter 6, we see this encounter of one side of the truth, which is we do come up short. We, we are sinners. But it's also a proclamation of the goodness of the gospel, which is Jesus makes us enough that he has done all the work for us. So in Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah is pulled up into heaven. He's given this wonderful vision. He sees these angels. And I've met so many people in my lifetime as a pastor and as a Christian that want to see what heaven is like, want to see angels. And I'm just letting you know, if you read your Bible, you probably don't want to do that. <laughs> because every time anybody gets pulled up into heaven, anytime anybody sees an angel, they're all terrified and have a panic attack over what is going on and where they are. And so this is what happens. And so as Isaiah is in heaven, he sees this in verse 3. He hears them singing this song, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And so it's this wonderful, beautiful, magnificent moment. You're in heaven. You get to see the throne of God. He's there in person. You see all these angels surrounding him, and they're singing a beautiful hymn, which a lot of our hymns have been based on. And you'd think, what a wonderful moment, right? <laughs> like, if, most of us would assume that if you're there, you're thinking, this is awesome. But in verse 5, Isaiah says, something that is a difficult truth. He says, woe is me, for I am lost. What he's saying is, I'm in big trouble. Woe is a, a Hebrew prophet way of saying of essentially death and destruction to me. He's, he's acknowledging, he's like, I am going to die. Like, I'm going to be destroyed. This is my end. And he says, I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips lips. So what Isaiah is saying about himself is what we say in our confession every week. I'm a sinner. Now he's doing something that we don't always do, which is he's being really honest about his sin. Now I'm going to ask you a question. It's a hard question. And I've, I've spent three years with you guys trying to get you to participate in sermons and you're getting better at it, okay? But this is going to be a tough one. You might be a little shy. We're in church. Jesus is here. Tell the truth. Fair enough? Okay. How many of you, going through the liturgy, we get to the confession part, right? I'm a poor, miserable sinner. How many of you, be honest now, he's watching, <laughs> have ever just gone through the motions on that part of the liturgy? at least once in your life. I mean, you really weren't like, yeah, okay, I'm a miserable sinner, that's great, whatever. Right, because you're just rolling on through it. Yeah, we all have. Sometimes because we don't want to acknowledge it, right? Like, it's not a fun statement, like, come to worship, why? Well, one of our first things that we're gonna say together <laughs> is that you're a terrible human being who's come up short. You still wanna come? Right? Like, so it's not, it's not a wonderful line that we, like, get enthusiastic about it. So, so sometimes we don't say it, because why? We, we just don't want to acknowledge it, right? Like, who, who, any of you use that line throughout the rest of your week when you're introducing yourself to new people? Like, tell me about yourself. Oh, uh, you know, I'm a poor, miserable sinner. You know, I'm working on it, but here we are. Right? Like, anybody ever said that at a party? <laughs> It'd be funny. You should try it. Let me know. Right? Other times... We don't do it, or we just kind of go through the motions, because guess what? Sometimes we're arrogant. We're filled with pride, and guess what? I don't think I'm that bad of a sinner, right? Here's my proof that you all agree with me at certain points. How many of you get excited to tell somebody, I'm sorry? You're just like, oh, good, they caught me, I messed up. 
tonight's my night to shine. I'm apologizing. Right? No. We, we resist it, right? So sometimes it's like I don't want to acknowledge it, right? I, just, I don't want to think about it. I'm not going to say it. And then other times it's, I don't think I'm that bad. I mean, like, yeah, I'm a sinner, but I'm not poor, miserable sinner. Like, I'm, I'm average, right? And what I love about Isaiah is he's just like, okay, this is it. Woe is me. I am a man of unclean lips. And then he even makes everybody else go. He's like, and I live amongst a people of unclean lips. And that's a way of saying it. Our words don't line up with our actions and our hearts. Our worship don't line up with the way that they should be. So he's basically saying our whole lives are one big mess. And Isaiah said, I'm a poor, miserable sinner. And I live with a bunch of poor, miserable sinners. Now here's the reality. That's true. Right? It's a hard reality. It's a hard truth. But it's true for Isaiah. And here's the part we don't like. It's true for you and me. So even if you might have gone through the motions on confessions, you know, I don't really mean it. The reality is we are all sinners. We're all coming up short. If we're measuring things and saying, like, how do I earn my salvation? And how do I live a perfect life? And how do I measure up for God? The reality of it is that I'm not enough. I can't do enough. I can't be enough on my own. Now, in Lutheran theology, we call that the law, right? It, it convicts us. It, it hits us in our hearts. We realize, I'm just like Isaiah. I am not holy. I am not perfect. I'm not enough. Now, here's the reality. Satan, because he wants to destroy you, he wants you to believe lies, he wants you to not have life. He wants you to stop right there. Right? He, he wants you to, to only believe that part of it. And if you've ever read scripture and, and studied how Satan works to tempt people, you will notice that what he's really good at is giving us half-truths. Taking just little bits of scripture to where our ears go, well, that sounds kind of right. It sounds familiar. So it must be what? True. What's in the Bible? And this is why it's so important that we hear John 10 where Jesus says, I'm the good shepherd who's come to give you life. My sheep listen to my voice, not whose voice, not Satan's, not the world, not even our own that can be negative on the inside, right? but that we would listen to the voice of Jesus, which declares to us the whole truth, not just a partial bit of it. So here's a partial bit of the truth is that you and I are like Isaiah. Woe is me. I've got unclean lips. Anybody ever said the wrong thing before? Okay, good. <laughs> you are like Isaiah. But the whole truth that the voice of Jesus declares is not just to leave us in our sin, not just to leave us in our uncleanness and our guilt and shame, but to raise us to new life. And this is exactly what happens with Isaiah verse six. Then one of the seraphim, one of the angels, flew to me having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. He touched my mouth and said, behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. What I love about this image is that the way Isaiah describes his sin is with his lips, right? He says, I'm a man of unclean lips. That doesn't mean that was the only part of Isaiah that was sinful, right? It's just the way he describes it. And so the way his sin is forgiven is how? By the coal touching what? His lips. And this is the beauty and the power of the forgiveness of Jesus is that it is actually for not just your general sins, right? Like, oh, I'm a poor, miserable sinner, but I want to get too detailed about it in church, right? I know I, I always say, okay, we're going to have a time for private reflection and, and confession, right? And isn't that everybody's favorite part of the service where I'm like, okay, it's not just generic anymore. I want you to get detailed, right? 
But here's the beauty of the grace of Jesus, the fruit of Jesus, is that it's for specific sins. It's not just, oh, yeah, I'm a sinner and okay. Because you know what happens when we do that? We just make it generic, like, oh, I'm a sinner, right? Nobody's perfect. That's always our defense. And, and then we go, oh, yeah, Jesus forgives. Okay, he forgives sins. That's wonderful. What happens is that leaves room for the lies of Satan to creep in and for guilt to keep holding on to you. Right? It's just like how I've counseled so many people that say, oh, I know Jesus forgives me, but I just can't forgive myself. What that is, is it's us believing the lies of Satan and kind of holding on to the guilt and say, yeah, but I mean, this thing was really bad. Anybody ever done the worst thing you've ever done? <laughs> Like, right, you, you got some guilt that you're like, yeah, that was pretty bad. Yes, no, right? Like, how many of you got a scale at your, in your heart, right? You're like, that was bad, I'm a sinner. But then there's other things you're like, that was really bad. Anybody? Right, yeah. So here's what happens. Jesus comes in and he goes, yeah, you're a sinner. You and I, we're, we're not enough on our own. That's, that's the first half of the truth. But the second half of the truth that you and I need to hear every day and be reminded of every day in our souls is that he forgives even that really big one. Even the one that's caused you the most guilt and shame, the most struggles. Right? The angel touches Isaiah's lips. He says, this is where your sin is. Okay, that's where I'm going to forgive you and make you clean. I'm going to take your guilt away. It's not there anymore. It doesn't exist for you anymore. Your sin's been atoned for. You don't have to make up any more payments, Right? That's the whole truth of Jesus. That's the whole gospel is that he takes away your guilt. You don't have to carry it around anymore. You don't have to beat yourself up anymore. You don't have to walk around telling yourselves the lies of Satan of like, I'm not good enough. I'm not worthy enough. I'm not enough. Instead, you just get to walk around going, I'm a sheep who belongs to Jesus. He's holding on to me. He's not letting go of me. He's taken that guilt away. We don't have to carry it and burden ourselves with it anymore. And the other aspect of the gospel, he says, your sin is atoned for. Atone is this Hebrew word that means to, to make payment for. Meaning, no, the payment's been paid. So guess what? You don't have to pay God back. Right? You don't become one of Jesus' sheep and then tell him, don't worry. I'm going to be really good this time. I know I wandered off last time, but this time I'm sticking close by. Anybody ever tried to negotiate with God after you've been forgiven, right? You're like, okay, that's great. You forgave me, but here's what I'm going to do now just to make it up to you. And when the gospel, the voice of God, the voice of Jesus says, your sin has been atoned for. He's setting you free and saying, oh, there's no more making up for it. I've already done it. You don't have to prove that you're enough. You don't have to prove that you're worthy or that you're doing better. You simply just trust that he loves you. He has forgiven you. He's already made all the payments. See, the lie of Satan wants you and I to get stuck in the first half, right? That half truth of, hey, woe is me. Right? I'm a sinner, right? It's easy to believe that part, isn't it? Right? How many of you are, it's easy for you to believe you're not perfect, Right? It's like, yeah, that's not hard to find out. <laughs> right? And this is why you and I have to listen to the voice of Jesus. Because the voice of Satan wants you to think only about that half truth. It says, yeah, you're a sinner. You're not enough. You're not worthy. But the voice of Jesus is the voice that declares the gospel to you and me. It says, your guilt has been taken away. Your sin has been atoned for. And you belong to Jesus. And the voice of Jesus says, hey, no matter how bad of a sinner you are, no matter how many times you come up short, no matter how many times you get lost or wander away, the voice of Jesus declares to you and me as his sheep, you belong to him. And he says in John chapter 10, no one can snatch them away from my hand. Not Satan, not the world, not our own thoughts, our own guilt or shame. No matter what, the good news of the voice of Jesus calling out to you is your guilt has been taken away, you've been atoned for, and you belong to him for all eternity. Let's pray.
Lord Jesus, we give thanks that we belong to you. And that even when we are not enough because of our sin, we know that you do make us enough. That you have taken away our guilt. You have atoned for our sin. And that because of you, we belong to you for all eternity. We have the promise of eternal life. Help us, Lord, as your sheep to listen to your voice every day, be reminded of the good news of your love for us. And may we be the kind of people who go out into the world and tell others about your good news and love for them as well. In your name we pray. Amen.